Hi, everyone. I'm Brene Brown, and this is Unlocking Us. And oh my God, I have such a deeply special episode for you today. I'm talking with singer, songwriter, activist, artist, Jake Wesley Rogers, someone I discovered on TikTok. I mean, fell in love, madly, truly, deeply in love with him and his art and how it made me feel and how it made me dance and how it made me sing. I cannot wait for you to hear this conversation. Before we get started, let me just tell you a little bit about Jake. He is, again, a singer, songwriter, activist, storyteller, artist. He is been inspired by the authenticity and artistry of his heroes like Lady Gaga, Stevie Nicks, Florence and the Machine. He is a poet and a lyricist. His songs are relatable and universal. He's just, he's light. He's light. Is that the right word, Barrett? Yes. He's light, he's love, he's joy, he's happiness. And he's sorrow and his pain and his truthfulness and oh yeah everything about him he's just a poet in 2020 hit songwriter justin tranter signed him to his imprint at warner records and his music has just blown us all away he had millions of streams right out of the gate his debut song middle of love oh I could sing it for you right now, but I won't. Immediately started a conversation among audiences, peers, and the press. It paved the way for his debut album, Pluto, which has been led by the single Weddings and Funerals. Oh, God. Yeah. I just, I can't even say enough, y'all. He has sold out by coastal dates on his 2021 headline tour well in advance. He has graced the stages of Lollapalooza, all kinds of music and arts festivals, and Tony, Emmy, and Grammy award winner Ben Platt has handpicked him to open his 2022 tour. So, y'all, just let the goodness shine on your face today because this is Jake Wesley Rogers. So, every now and then I come across an artist or a thinker, and I think to myself, I'm just glad I'm alive the same time this person is alive. And that's what I think about you. Thank you, Brene. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is so surreal. Um, immediately when you posted on Instagram, I called my mom, but she was already asleep because I was in LA and she was in Missouri. And I just kind of sat in my car and cried. So, <laughs> oh. yeah, no, I watch your TikToks and your reels and I follow you on Instagram. And finally I was like, okay. I'm just going to reach out and it's going to be so weird, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. So hi. (laughs) Well, hello. It's such an honor. So thank you for reaching out. (laughs) Okay. So I'm really excited about this first question because it's where we always start. Will you tell us your story? Yes. And I knew you'd ask that. (laughs) And I, uh, I still don't know where to begin, but I was born in Missouri in the heart of the Bible Belt. Mm. And I have a brother, and my mom works in radio, so I was going to a lot of concerts as a kid, um, always around music, and I was pretty obsessed with art from a young age. I was kind of the one that would put on shows in the living room, like put on a Britney Spears DVD and just dance (laughs) for my family. (laughs) It's pretty clear who I was, but the Bible Belt didn't affect that part of me at all. God, praise God. Literally, praise God. And I loved visual art as a kid. I loved painting and drawing and that sort of side. And I quickly got into theater. I think my parents didn't really know what to do with all of my energy, my yearning to be on stage. So luckily, they were smart and put me in theater. What age were you when they put you in theater? Like seven, seven. I was a lost oh, boy. Wow. In like, <laughs> yeah, no, like that's a critical age. What did they make of your talent when you were little? What did they make of your talent and who you were and who you wanted to be and when you came alive? What were their thoughts about that? They were 
always ready to drive me anywhere, to take me anywhere. And it really, it kind of affects me in a deeper way now, just knowing like the sacrifice of, you know, driving 30 minutes to the city. They would get home from work at 5 p.m. <laughs> they would drive me to rehearsal at 6 p.m. I had a rehearsal for four hours. They'd go back home and then they'd come back and pick me up. And, and thinking about that now is, mm. is just, just mind blowing, you know, the sacrifice of that but it was so crucial to me because I think the theater saved me in a lot of ways as a young gay person in Missouri to be around other people like me you know a lot of people ask me well what was it like to grow up like you there and I think because I kind of had that safety net there were still those things but I always had the people I always had the people like me where I didn't really feel othered. I'd go to school and I'd feel othered, but I always knew at night I had, I had that mm. to look forward to. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So you go into theater seventh grade. I want to know everything. <laughs> theater seventh grade. And you know, that was, that was an interesting time because that's when I realized I was gay and it sort of blew up at first because I was messaging this boy on Facebook at the time who was also at the theater and my parents found the messages and it was a complete shock. You know, it was a complete tidal wave. I think a lot of things have changed since then. You know, that was 2008 and the progress we've made is miraculous. And I just, I think at the time my parents didn't think you would know that at that age, you know, and that was kind of one of my earliest memories of like, oh, I feel different and not in a good way and not in a mm -hmm. safe way. And that's actually kind of when I started writing songs. Mm. I was listening to so much, you know, like Lady Gaga and Adele and Regina Spector, these kind of like outspoken, oh. like eclectic artists. And that's, you know, I was kind of forced back in the closet for a few years. But in my art and in my music, it was always this like safe place. And I think because my parents, they grew so much in that time, but they also always respected me as an artist. And for some reason, I was able to tell them things in music that I wasn't really able to tell them in real life. So I think songwriting kind of saved me during that time. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no. A place to put your heart. Yeah. 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 A safe capsule because I think I heard Alanis Morissette say like songwriting is cathartic, but it's not healing. And I think what she meant by that is that like it's this release, it's this, you know, otherworldly feeling. We've all felt it when they're listening to it or making it, but it doesn't heal. It doesn't really do all the work, you know. I think the right. work kind of comes after and songwriting for me has kind of always been that. It's sort of feels like a premonition sometimes, like for instance, I can write a breakup song a year and a half before breaking up with someone. And then I look back and I'm like, oh, <laughs> I guess that's how I feel. <laughs> I guess that's how I felt then. It took my ego yeah. a while to get there. Yeah. Is it prophetic sometimes? Are you like, oh, shit. <laughs> it does feel that way, but it also kind of feels like a useless magic because it's not like I do anything with it. You know, I write the song and it feels really good and then it takes the therapy and the meditation and the living and the everything to actually actualize it. So I think that's why music for me is so mysterious because it's almost like it exists somewhere else, you know? I think that's true. I think maybe it exists on a different plane because sometimes when I listen, like when I listen to your music, I go somewhere that's otherworldly. Hmm. Mostly to a place that I want to live when I listen to your music. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's, 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 that's all I want. And that's what I, you know, that's what I found so many times. Like I remember listening to Lady Gaga in middle school and, you know, my mom would take me to the concerts and we'd be all like dressed up. And it was like in that place, in that place, I could be whoever I wanted to be. Mm. And that's the freedom of it. And that's truly what I'm interested in as a creator, you know, like through your work, I've learned and now I've seen firsthand that anytime I'm honest and authentic and true, it just opens up this Pandora's box of beauty <laughs> of people who don't have the same story, but obviously have the same story. And it's, it's pretty miraculous. 
it's like everything you say, I could just make into a quote that I need to really examine for a long time as a researcher. <laughs> like people that were not the same as me, but were clearly the same as me. Mm-hmm. When I listen to your music, I say, oh, he's singing to me. He knows. How does he <laughs> You know, and I'm like, your mom, I could be your mom. I'm probably older than your mom. But I'm like, he is singing. He's trying to tell me something. Mm. He's telling me to let go of this thing. Like, Mm. and it is miraculous. And it is a mystery that I think should never be revealed. Music. I agree. I totally agree. I think, you know, one of the most profound examples I've found recently of this is I get messages definitely from people who either are gay or, or trans or some sort of experience that's a little more aligned with mine. Yeah. But a couple months ago, I got this message from this person and he heard my song, Jacob from the Bible, I think just on Spotify or, or something. And I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said, I heard your song on a playlist and I thought it was a beautiful song. And then I listened to it again later and I realized it was a gay love story. And he was currently in the fundamental Christian mindset. I'll never hear what he said. He said, it made me ask the question, how could something so beautiful be so Mm. evil? Mm. And yeah, I still get chills when I think about it because that person before he heard that song literally thought I was evil. And I never made that song for someone like him. Mm -hmm. But it reached him and it made me think of these like cages that we put ourselves in. Like I was in the closet. I was in that cage. This person was in the religious cage. And I think it's kind of the job of the artist to just drop keys, you know, just to to leave a key, leave a key, you know, (laughs) like that's, that's what I feel like I'm trying to do. Like you don't have to pick it up. You don't even have to acknowledge it, but if you want it, it's there. And I'm trying to figure out what cage I'm in because I'm still in one. I know I am, you know, yeah. so we all are. Yeah. And I think sometimes we're in cages of our own making. You know, there's definitely reality. You know, there's definitely homophobia and heterosexism and this incredibly violent anti-trans stuff that we're in right now. And then there are cages of our own making. I mean, I know Laverne Cox and I talk often about perfectionism as mm-hmm. a cage. You drop keys. Mm. In so many ways. <laughs> and you drop keys. You've given me some big, beautiful keys. <laughs> some like hefty ones. <laughs> keys. You know, it's so incredible to me how you distinguish catharsis from healing. Because I think we lose so many people, and I lose myself sometimes, in thinking the catharsis moment is the heavy lift of healing and transformation, but it's just the portal to the work. Exactly. Yeah. You know, like you're saying, it doesn't take you through the messiness, through the hardness, through doing the therapy. It's an amazing insight from you. It has become apparent over and over again. It's like the catharsis is almost the gift. You know, it's the aha but it doesn't do the work. It's like that maybe the catharsis is the key in a way, you know, Mm -hmm. it's leading us to what we need to do. The hard shit, the coming out again at 16, you know, and (sighs) saying I am gay. And, you know, my parents saying, we know we love you. We're here. And Mm -hmm. it just, it takes courage, I guess, (laughs) as you know, (laughs) as we know. Yeah. It's like vulnerability and courage to use the key, then vulnerability and courage to walk through the door. Mm -hmm. and then vulnerability and courage to stay on the other side that like give me a fucking break like can't you just give me a magical moment (laughs) do you know what I mean can I just live outside for a little bit (laughs) yeah can I have no walls for a while yeah no walls for just Mm. yeah a Mm. brief second maybe tell me about high school there's a line in one of your songs that tells me a lot about high school (laughs) do you want to know how much I didn't like high school yeah I didn't finish high school. I like homeschooled my last two years. Right on. Yeah. My friends joked about that lyric because they're like, you didn't even go to high school. (laughs) (laughs) They're like, how can you hate something that you didn't do? And I was like, well, I tried it and I just, I didn't like it. But high school is interesting in a lot of ways because when I was 15, I was on America's Got Talent. 
And that was like this, ooh, <laughs> burden gift. That's the word I'll use in a way, because when I was that age, I thought that that was my way to success. I thought I need to do one of these shows to do that. And obviously my parents were like, yes, let's go. Let's audition. And, and I ended up making it, you know, like on the live shows and, it was one of those things where once I was done with it, I went back to Missouri and, you know, everybody in my small town, they're like, oh my God, you made it, you know, mm. you're doing it. Like, mm. and then on the yeah. inside, and I didn't have the words for this yet, but I was feeling shame. I was feeling like, I was feeling shame that I didn't go further. I was feeling shame that I did it at all. I was feeling shame that I put myself out there, that I'm back in Missouri. And I thought that all my dreams were going to come true. It was just like this, this weight of shame. And, but I did learn one very important thing. And that was that this road, any quick fix is never going to be the path. You know, the path is very narrow and those things don't lead to where I want to go. And I'm glad I learned that so young. It was hard to learn that so young. And I even feel a little silly complaining about it because it was a beautiful opportunity. But I came back at 15 and I was like, oh, Jake was on TV, you know, Jake's doing this. And then I stopped going to high school and just homeschooled. And, and I think I've really committed though then to this path of the artist. I don't think I knew that. I don't think I knew that that choice I made then was like, okay, that didn't work, but I think I know what can. This is going to be a really, really long road. And it has been. It has been. So high school was interesting in that way. But, you know, I did that. And, and I also dated, my first like real relationship was with like a preacher's son, <laughs> which has a whole, oh, wow. whole, ba- yeah. that's a whole, that's a whole nother podcast. But, you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> it was like this clandestine experience with, you know, Jake doing music and it was really a hard, confusing time. So yes, to quote myself, I really fucking hated high school. <laughs> the lyric stands. The lyric stands. Yes. And I just want to validate, not that anybody or anything needs it, but you don't have to go to high school to know that you fucking hate high school. <laughs> like, yes. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, it's what so a true. volatile mix of shame and insecurity and meanness and armor. And yeah, I remember going to my 30-year reunion and my husband was like, do you want me to go with you? And I said, no, I don't even know how long I'm going to stay. I just, I need to go because it's like a river. Like I thought there was a big river mm-hmm. behind our house. But then when I saw it as a grown up, it was like a little creek. And I'm thinking maybe it wasn't as hateful and terrible as I thought. So I just need to go and reality check. Maybe that rushing river is just a creek. And so I went to my high school reunion and I was there for like 30 minutes and I came home and he's like, what'd you think? And I was like, it was a big raging river of shit. It was exactly (laughs) what I thought. I was there. And then I made up, I guess what your experience was like. I had physical safety. Mm. In high school, because I just was it like kind of like everybody else, just miserable on the inside. And I thought, wow, what about this experience? And you have no physical safety, Mm. emotional safety. And so, yeah, your words are powerful. You know, your story just reminds me that those experiences are always within us. You know, like we can be 30 years outside of high school and you're just triggered. You're triggered right back to it. And I think I got sort of a pass in high school because I was the one that did music because Mm -hmm. I think people I've learned are okay with you being different as long as you're entertaining or as long as you're (sighs) giving them something. And I think my flamboyancy, all of that fashion, it was given a pass for the most part because I could sing and I could sing the national anthem at the volleyball game and blah, 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 you know? All of that. I sort of found my way to fit in. Yeah. And it was as long as you were in service of other people. Yes. That's exactly. really powerful and really, maybe its own form of violence, I guess, in some ways. Do you know what I mean? Perhaps. Yeah. 
that you have to make yourself a commodity if you're different instead of just yeah. being different, you know? And I think that's a lot what I was exploring in these songs that I just put out was really embracing that. Because that's the joke, right? That's how funny it is that we all feel like that. Even the boy wearing Abercrombie and boat shoes felt that. <laughs> and so even though they looked the same, they didn't feel the same. I'm assuming maybe they did. I'm sure there's some people that do, but <laughs> I'm not friends with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've never met a person that didn't have a cage. So, and, yeah, you know, but some people deal with their cages maybe by deciding that they're going to spend their lives dropping keys, and other people deal with their cages through rage and making sure other people are more caged than they are. I think that's right. Throwing away their keys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hiding keys. Mm. Yeah. Tell me about the first time you saw Justin Tranter. Oh, <laughs> that, oh, I mean, I can start crying thinking about that. Um, I was in London writing, actually, you know, all these songs. I was writing Pluto and whatever, and I got this DM from Justin, <gasps> which blew my mind because Justin Tranter, if anyone doesn't know, is an incredibly, incredibly powerful and successful songwriter and activist you know you've heard his songs <laughs> like you may not know who his name is but you have heard his songs and you can sing along to his songs whether you know him or not yeah exactly and i actually saw his band open for lady gaga when i was 13 mm. he was in a glam rock band called semi-precious weapons so that's kind of where it began and then you know fast forward 10 years and I get this message from this person I really admire. And he had heard my song, Jacob from the Bible. And um, he was just saying he loved it. And I was like, okay, good. Kind of like when he messaged me, I was like, I was happy with you not knowing who I was, but this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> I was very happy being a passive bystander and enjoying your work. But this is great. But it turns out he had just started a label, a record label. And I didn't even know that. And when you asked the first time I saw him, I, it's one of the most humbling moments of my life because I, I was so nervous to meet him and to write with him. And I remember I went to a Starbucks near his house an hour before I was supposed to meet with him because I was like, <laughs> just so nervous to be late or like, you know, it's one of those nightmares where they're like, oh, something happened with the calendar. You know, it was actually right now. I was like, I'm not going to do that. And I remember I put on a little playlist and put on. I don't think I've ever even told him this, but on, you know, like rolling in the deep and then probably edge of 17 or something. And, oh yeah. And I just walk in and I remember he opened up his big, beautiful door and he just put his arms up. And that moment really changed my life. Really changed my life. I have goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. It's, it's hard to put into words. The feeling of thank you, God, thank you, universe, for bringing us together because, you know, like I was writing on my own. I was at that time, I hadn't really no proof. I didn't really feel like I had any proof of what I was doing was good or meaningful or whatever. And he kind of met me with all his power and his force and said, no, you're going to do this and we are going to tell your story because there are gay rock stars and pop stars and someone listening to this might be able to correct me but almost none of them have been out from the beginning you know it's only once they're too big to fail you know it's mm -hmm. only once they have a massive song where no one can deny them and i think that's kind of the next step is to be able to be us from the beginning so i think that's something that he's really encouraged me to do and it's something that he ran into a lot of trouble with, with his band. He was telling me like he didn't get to plan any late night shows because he was just too femme to whatever, you know, like all this stuff. And it's like, okay, but we get to do this now. So let's like not mess this up. I feel so much hope when I hear that. And I feel so much grief when I hear that. Mm. About a world where you have to have the wind at your back to be who you are like versus the wind is at your back because you are who you are. <laughs> mm. Do 
see what I mean? Mm. And maybe, maybe it is the latter, you know? Maybe yeah. that is there. But a lot had to change first. People had to pave the way. Yeah, it's, it's the macro example of the catharsis plus the work. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like we had moments in history mm. where we confronted our heterosexism and our homophobia, but then there were decades of the work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I see you now, and I think that's why when I see you, not only am I completely transported by your music, like your music is so emotional, right? Is that fair characterization? That's me, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I mean, you're, it's so emotional. Like when I, I don't know if it's because I saw your TikTok, but like when I sing it, I'm not just like, hate on me. Hey, I'm like, hey, you know, I've got my fists up and then I put my head down and then I come back up like this with my hands in the air. And yeah. I'm like, you might as well hate on the sun. Like, <laughs> it is, you know what it is for me? What? Ironically. What? Church. Oh, oh my God. Your music's church. Now I'm crying. (laughs) Hmm. Church of love. Church of love. That's one of the best affirmations because church for so many has not been Mm. that. And I, I think that's what church is, is coming together to get to the heart of the matter, you know, and to feel something deeper and, I'd love for music to be that. Music's been that for me for so long and it empowers me in a way. I remember just being a little kid and like always feeling so shy. You know, I think back to like being a little kid and I felt like I was like a little monk, but then I'd step on stage and it's, <laughs> yeah. you know, it gives us wings and it, it, that's all I want. That's all I want is just to drop some keys and build some wings. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're doing it, man. (laughs) You really are. Like, you know, I'm a faithful, spiritual person. I've got a great relationship with God, a questionable relationship with church. But I see God in you. Like, Mm. when you are in your full power and you're singing those words and you're telling those stories, like, that is a spiritual experience. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know. I'm just going to pause. I got nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it, 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 it is like, and I'm, I'm in full hallelujah praise mode when I'm singing along with you. So oh. it, it's not pretty, but it's, it's real. Well, it's funny because I feel like when I wrote that chorus, like hate on me, I like started laughing because I was turning to the person I was writing with. And I was like, is that the stupidest thing I've <gasps> ever said? It was doubt because I was like, to say hate on me. And then he's like, no, I was afraid in that moment. I felt it so much. I think that I was mm. afraid to say that, you know, I was afraid to like be that bold and that whatever self lovey or loving really, because, because I hadn't felt it before. And I think in writing too, like the times where I'm sort of kind of laugh or I'm surprised are usually like, those are the best moments. I mean, that's catharsis. I never thought I'd write a song that said hate on me in it. I can put that on as sort of some armor, you know, like if I get any comments or whatever, it's like, no, you might as well literally hate the sun. Like that is how foolish it is to pass judgment onto someone else is by hating the thing that gives us light. So I swear to God, I should have not shaved my legs today because I've got goosebumps for like the fifth time. <laughs> there was no point in it this morning at all, uh, even though I was trying to look spiffy for you. I thought about that lyric a lot as a shame researcher. Hate on me, hate on me, hate on me, hate on me. You might as well hate the sun shining just a little too bright. Fucking, that's church. Sorry. I mean, <laughs> Let's go to church. <laughs> it, it is. Well, let me ask you this. Who inspired you? Who took you to church? Who took you to that place when you were young listening to their music? Which artist Mm. took you, transported you 
to what was possible. Mm. I've talked about her a lot, but Gaga did. Mm. Gaga did for me. It was her ugliness, not her being ugly. She's beautiful, but just her embracing of those Mm -hmm. ugly things of the darkness and the thing that makes you different and singing about that. You remember hearing born this way for the first time and I was like, Oh oh my God. Like I get to, I get to live in a world where this song is on the radio. And that was the step in the direction. And then in high school, I took a very deep Stevie Nicks dive and I'm still (laughs) swimming in those waters. And, and that's just a different thing because that for me was just like, Oh, she put it all on the line in her words and her life and her art and her fashion and everything. You know, she was the art and is the art. And I think that helped me a lot. And then I started getting a lot. I like literature is always just and books have kind of been my biggest inspiration, you know, the past few years. Um, you know, finally reading authors like finally reading Walt Whitman, my Angelo. Mm. And Oscar Wilde, these kind of, these Mm. voices that led a generation. And I feel very carried by those people. And I think about them all the time. So all those people, (laughs) they're at our church. (laughs) They're at our church. This is a church I would go to. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like the procession would be edge of 17. And then we would do a little poker. Yeah. Yeah. This would be good. (laughs) Tell me what it was like doing the, I could barely watch it. I had the biggest shit eating grin the whole time I was watching this podcast with you and Elton John. Tell me about this podcast. (laughs) Oh my God. I don't need, here's what I'll say. They said he's going to call between nine and nine 30. I was sitting there in a hotel room. My manager was like on the other side of the room. It was like nine 20. And I was like, can I jump out of that window right now? (laughs) I was like, I can't, I can't do this. I can't, <laughs> I can't do this. But I did it. Those are the moments where you're like, oh, I'm literally going to be split in half if I do this. Those are the moments where we're just expanding. And I feel like I expanded. And I also feel like I have a knack for, and my body does this really beautiful thing where it just kind of hides things from me until I'm brave enough to confront them. And I think that's one of those things. And I'm probably going to wake up in a couple months and have a heart attack. <laughs> like, <laughs> and on the other hand, to get an affirmation from him, it, I was like, well, I guess I don't suck. <laughs> that, that was I think my, that's a safe assumption. That was my first thought. And then I just thought, oh, this is really, really cool. Yeah. Talk about someone who paved the way who yeah. put it all out on the line and continues to, is continues to support new music and be edgy. And I'm 100% okay with people comparing. Like, it's the most humbling thing to be compared to someone like him because at the end of the day, he's probably the coolest person that ever lived. So. <laughs> I could never argue that with you. Like, yeah. 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 Like, he, he's. Yeah. And I've heard the comparison. I think the biggest compliment I could probably ever give you from my brain is that I think you defy definition. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just something deeply spiritual about you. But I do think he was so impressed with how tall you were, plus the platform shoes. It it was such a (laughs) sweet moment because he's like, wait a minute. You know, like, because you know, he was digging your shoes. Like those platform shoes. I, and he's like, how tall are you before the platform shoes? And then, <laughs> are you 6'4"? Six, I'm 6'4", six, yeah. So do you hit seven feet with some of your shoes? Uh, yeah, I think I have. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it. That's how I'm reclaiming my power and my dominance over my life. It's just by making myself taller and taller and taller and taller. <laughs> yeah, you are the epitome of the Amy Cuddy power pose, man. You yes. are like... I'm trying. Yeah. Honestly, if you have any tips though for heels, I'm still really getting used to them. Doing the pair I wore on my first late night show, they were a size too big. Ooh. And the whole performance, I was just like, don't fall, don't fall, don't fall, 
don't fall. <laughs> yeah, you so, rocked it. I watched. We're getting used to it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I can give you no tips because I hate to fall into like a social worker stereotype, but I'm a solid clog girl. And so <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait for know, my clog phase. Could... <laughs> oh my God. Come on. You cannot be like, you got to have a clog face. Do you do dance goes or are you open? Do you see him? Do you like, I love this guy. Do you do dance goes? Oh hell yes. I do <laughs> dance goes. Maybe I I'll do, get a pair. I'll get a yeah, do some dance goes and I've got a Swedish brand. I'll send it to you. I'll slide okay. back into your DMs and give you the Swedish clogs. Dude, I would adore a pair of Swedish clogs from you. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I just need to get your size. I'm going to send you some really, Beautiful. I have some patent leather red ones. Ooh. Only you and I could pull those off. Can I please match you? I really. Oh yeah, we'll, okay. just, we'll do it at the same time. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so before we go, I want to mention some songs. I want you to give me a sentence or two about what they mean to you. Okay. Weddings and funerals. Mm. It's, I think, a love poem to my grandpa who mm. was dying because of heartbreak from losing my grandma. And it made me look at my relationship I was in and think about us at 85 and think about Am I going to die if this person dies? Or am I, mm-hmm. can I survive without this person? And that thought scared the shit out of me mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. led me to that song. God, it's so beautiful. And ultimately ending the relationship. <laughs> but, and ultimately ending the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I think that seeing my grandpa go through that it was, it just, I stepped out of the patterning, I feel like. I stepped mm. out of the patterning. So that's when I feel that song, that's what it makes me think of stepping out, paving my way, you know? I heard the grief about your grandpa. And then, you know, what I left that song thinking that there are a hundred weddings and funerals in the course of every relationship. Mm. Mm-hmm. Like, I saw the exterior of that song, but I also felt the interior of that song. Mm. Like within one relationship, there are so many formal proclamations of commitment and love and so many deaths contained even in one relationship. You're so right. Yeah. There was something about weddings and funerals that you know who it reminded me of? Mm. Leonard Cohen. Mm. (laughs) Do you know Leonard Cohen? I love Leonard Cohen. Yes. Yeah. 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 Incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. (laughs) Of course. Yeah. Okay. Middle of love. Oh, talk about a funeral. That song is one of the funerals. (laughs) (laughs) Literally the first line, look at us showing up to the funeral was like, oh, we're having a fight. We're, and it's so complicated because I love you so much. Yes. The truth about that song is that the fight happened at a Sonic (laughs) drive-in. Did it really? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And it was one of those, this could either be a funeral or lead to another wedding. And it led to another wedding. And it was beautiful for a time after that. So when I think of that song, I think of, I guess, the wedding and the funerals of that relationship and of how much I loved and how hard I loved and how hard it was to love and how hard it was to leave, but how much love there was in leaving. So that's kind of what that feels like to me now. What is it about the chorus of that song that is just, how do you do that? Like, (laughs) yeah, I'm going to stay here for a second. (laughs) Like, how does that work? Is there like a magic combination of notes and music that makes everybody like, I'm in the middle. I mean, like, how do you do that? How do you capture that churchy, do you do that on purpose? You can't think about any of those things when you're writing. Oh, that's what I thought Sadly. the answer was going to be. Sadly, you can't. But I will bring Justin Trancher back into this conversation. And, you know, I wrote both of those songs with him. And he has this intuition when it comes to melody and to lyrics and to trusting whatever's happening. I think that's it, is trusting the ride. And that's why I love working with him, because I am someone who... 
I will write something and then I will immediately attack it <gasps> with the hate on me line. You know, I wrote it. I was like, oh, that's beautiful. And then critic stepped in and Justin being so free and open and smart, frankly, says, no, that's fucking great. Let's do it. I remember when I wrote the lyric, I was like, middle of love, like, that's kind of a simple title. Where's the depth in that? And Justin's like, no. And that's my work, right? That's my work. Yeah. Trusting what's happening. But I think collaborating with someone who does encourage that and does say like, no, this is really good. This is worth fighting for. Mm. And yeah, and I think that's the hardest part. And I think I've actually heard you talk about that when there's comparison, when there's any sort of intellectual attacking there's no room for creativity you know like creativity oh, yeah. exists in this place where you're not thinking about anything like that but i'm someone that a lot of time exists in the other place but i'm lucky enough to be able to clear moments where i can find that sacred energy and not compare myself and not try to make something that sounds like this or that or whatever okay i want to ask you about two more because this okay. is just yeah pluto <laughs> when I was a kid, Pluto was still a planet. I'm still kind of sad about it. Mm. It's so funny because I don't know how you thought of that line, but I remember, <laughs> you're going to think this is so crazy dumb, but I remember having to tell my kids that Pluto had been decommissioned. <laughs> as a planet and I remember my daughter's 22 now and my son's 16 and I just remember it was a moment like people were really sad about it and my son had a big mobile of all the planets and he said well it'll stay a planet in this room and so when you started your song that way I was like I'm not gonna make it through this <laughs> yeah I think and what I remember feeling was exactly what you're talking about is like oh they can't see him away. And for some reason, I made him a him. I don't know. He just seems like a little sweet planet. Yeah, a little sweet guy planet. He's all the way out there. He's yeah. the coldest one. He's the darkest one. And then suddenly we said, actually, you don't belong anymore. <laughs> <laughs> actually, you know, we're just gonna, we moved the finish line. And I think that's actually what I had in mind. I'll never forget the day I wrote that. I was in London. It was Halloween. So almost two years ago. And I was working with this songwriter, Egg White, who I was so nervous to write with. This is before I even met Justin. I love Egg White. You know, he's written some of my favorite Adele songs, Florence and the Machine songs. He's kind of people that I was obsessed with. And everybody was like, don't be late to meet Egg White. And he's always done at 6 p.m., no matter what. And like, you know, so I bought a witch hat that morning. <laughs> and I... Went over, I was on the tube in London, and everyone was in their suits. I forgot that people don't wear Halloween costumes in the morning. I always forget that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> and I go, and I show up right at 10. He's like, I like your hat. I'm like, thank you. We ultimately wrote Pluto, which surprised the hell out of me. And that's what I love when I'm surprised, mm -hmm. when a song surprises me. I was really getting into astrology at that point, and I came up with the title Pluto in Sagittarius because this is a whatever. Basically, if you were born from 1995 to 2008, your Pluto is in Sagittarius. And I was thinking about those people, my generation, of like, we were told Pluto is a planet when we, in like second or third grade, and then in fourth grade, they said it wasn't. Um, and he's like, I don't think we can put Sagittarius in a song. And I was like, that's probably fair. And then we ended up working until like 8 p.m., way after everyone said, because he loved the song, and then I went out into the streets of London and everyone was in their costumes. And it was like this kind of moment of like, oh, I'm not a freak. We're all freaks. <laughs> We're all freaks. We're all freaks. And sometimes we just need an excuse to be a freak. Oh my God. So I knew there had to be a great story behind this song because it's just, <laughs> it's got too many layers and it's too good to not have a narrative that's as wild as the song. <laughs> the day feels almost mythical in a way, like in my memory. But it's also like the line that always gets me the most. And I didn't really know why I wrote it then, but it was, I think of my mom. She loves me no matter what. That really fucks me up. And I think why I wrote that is because I had seen so many 
queer people in particular around me that have been completely disowned. Mm -hmm. That I had a friend in college that he was like, give us our car back. You're off our insurance. You're off our phone. I was like, oh my God, I have parents that didn't do that. And there was this sort of guilt. You know, it does fuck me up. It does fuck me up to be loved unconditionally. And it's something that I need to work to allow myself. Because it's, I don't think it's our nature or my nature to like be okay with that kind of love. And that's kind of my work right now is to allow myself to be loved in that way. It's not easy. It's vulnerable. You know, it's scary it's not easy to be loved like that and i think and maybe the most unconditional being loved like that unconditionally what it asks in return mm. is self-love mm. totally and that's a big ask because if you if you are being loved yeah you must love yourself in order to mm -hmm. have that love and oh ooh. okay i'm taking notes from my therapist <laughs> <laughs> um, i just taking take notes. your songs and you just go through like lyric by lyric <laughs> okay last one i want to ask you about before we get to rapid fire hold on i've got all my lyrics right here <laughs> oh my god jeez us this song Whew. If you're church, this is like the, I don't even know. This is communion or something. Here. <laughs> Cause of a scene. Ooh. I'm quite good at secrets, according to my horoscope. I spend my life conflicted. Heavenly bodies made it so. Mm. God dang it. That song um, sort of makes me want to throw up still. <laughs> Really? And that it is the closest I feel I've ever gotten to me in a song. It's the most understood I've ever felt by something I've made. And it's so cathartic to sing and so painful, too. Because I think I wrote it when I was really starting to understand patterning and what love could do to someone and oh god you know and, and singing the singing the bridge especially now that i'm playing shows it's like every time just kind of hurts because you know my grandpa and my ex had the same name and they never got mm -hmm. to meet because my parents didn't think it was a good idea i know i honored their request and now they're both out of my life and it's not easy it's definitely not easy, but I'm glad, I'm glad I have it to sing. Mm. This song really is the communion song. It is the breaking of the bread. Mm -hmm. You're at the rail, man. <laughs> well, it's so hard to ask for what you need, I've oh. found. And that's what the song's really about. That's, that's what the song is. You know, I had my horoscope read and they said, oh, you're really good at keeping it inside of bottling it up this planet this planet and i was like oh god you know like like it's your work yeah. to to let it out and then ironically i let it out in a song <laughs> yeah and to wear it on the it's sleeve just... is not easy for me it's really not no there's emotion in this song like when you sing this song like it's hard to not cry when you sing this song mm. it's hard for me not to cry when i listen to you sing this song 
Mm. The only thing that helps me is I'm usually acting it out and however you sang it in my living room <laughs> and my family's like, oh Jesus God, this is. <laughs> I used to dance to Britney Spears in my living room. And are you saying you dance yeah. to me in your living room? <laughs> I totally do. No, I make the fists and I strain and like I, all the veins in my neck come out and I'm like, I'm blue like the, I mean, like I do the whole thing. It's like, Yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't know if your uh, kids will be listening to this, but would you please record that for me? Because I really want to see it. <laughs> oh, God, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no, 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 no. I was like, no, just personally, uh, I really want to see this. I really want to see this. <laughs> now, I might I might send you something just with me, me doing you. But, but it's so it. emotional. I would treasure it. All right, you ready for some rapid fires? <sighs> I think so. I gotta ask you before we do this, your clothes are fantastic. No. <laughs> Where do you get them? Anywhere, everywhere. I mean, I love thrifting, but lately a lot of the costumes, you know, I've been able to work with designers and stuff like that kind of crafting. But, you know, that's like one thing I just loved as a kid. Like I would have these little journals where I would like design outfits. And I, I really feel like my mom said recently, she was at this photo shoot I was doing and she's like, oh, your inner child must be so happy right now because when you're a kid you just loved like putting on my clothes or putting your dad's clothes and I love it I really find a lot of power in it so yeah it's beautiful <laughs> it's art right it's it art. is art it's art it's wearable art and I did get out my little tea thing to see how heavy it would be to wear it as an earring <laughs> I have to because <laughs> when you do your TikTok in your, what's that thing called? Like a little tea holder? Uh, like called? a steeper, tea steeper. Tea steeper. And you've got the tea steeper in the <laughs> cup and then you sit up. It's funny. It's funny to me. I just love to spread the light. And, you know, that you was do. my first, I made three TikToks last year and I did not want to be on the app. I was very resistant towards the app. And I made a TikTok where I had the tea in the earring and then I was reading these sentences from this New York Times article where they're talking about how Abraham Lincoln was most likely gay. And, you know, in the end, I say the tea is done. And that's the first thing that ever, like, went viral or anything. And it freaked me out so much that I, like, deleted the app for, like, three months. <laughs> but then I took it back, and now I just, you know, I woke up this morning, and I was like, Brene Brown knows who I am because of TikTok. Thank God <laughs> for TikTok. <laughs> I'm not mad at TikTok anymore. <laughs> yeah, I know. I just, like, my husband will literally be like, well, you got to go to bed and stop watching him on TikTok. It's like, look, you find your liberation, I'll find my liberation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ready? Number one, fill in the blank for me. Vulnerability is? Courage. Okay. You, Jake, are called to be very brave, but your fear is real. You can feel it in the back of your throat. What's the very first thing you do? Call my mom. <laughs> <laughs> can we make hearts come out of the podcast stuff when he says that? <laughs> okay. What is something people often get wrong about you? My height. I don't think they think I'm this tall. The last TV show that you binged and loved? The Sopranos. <laughs> oh, man. Did you love it? I, I do love it. I do. Yeah. Oh, okay. One of your all-time favorite movies. Not even just because it's Halloween, but Scream is like my favorite movie of all time. And I really couldn't tell you why. <laughs> I really, I just, I, there's no rational thought for it, but it is. Yeah. That's great. Okay. A concert that you'll never forget. Lady Gaga Monster Ball. Favorite meal. Chicken tenders. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing right by your generation, Jake. I, I don't even I don't even eat gluten anymore, but it's still my favorite meal. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Okay, what's on your nightstand? Lately, it's changed a lot because I haven't had a consistent one, but I really love to keep Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman on my nightstand and, yeah. a, and a little crystal. Yeah. A snapshot of an ordinary moment in your life that gives you real joy. My hour I take in the morning to meditate and do yoga. Tell me one thing that you're deeply grateful for right now. Hmm. I am deeply grateful to be, I'm back in Nashville right now and I've been in LA for two months and there's no 
differentiation in the weather. And I'm just so glad it kind of feels like fall. Like mm. really, it's really making me happy. The seasons. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Before we get to your mini mixtape, which I was so curious to see, do you have any news to share with us about Ben Platt? Ben Platt? <laughs> <laughs> this, is yeah. like, this is like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, going on tour with Ben Platt next year. It's like 27 dates, North America. So everyone should come. We're coming to Houston. I'm pretty sure. Oh, I'll be there. Okay, cool. 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 I'll see you there. I can't wait. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll wear my red clogs. Just so I'll wear can. my red clogs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We asked you for, we make these mini mixtapes of all of our podcast guests on Spotify. And we asked you for five songs you can't live without. So, Strong Enough by Sheryl Crow, Born This Way by Lady Gaga, oh God, The Joke by Brandi Carlisle, come on, that song. Dancing on My Own by Robin, and Landslide by Fleetwood Mac. Mm. In one sentence, what does this mini mixtape say about Jake Wesley Rogers? I like to have fun while I cry. <laughs> <laughs> You are such a gift, and I am so grateful for your art, your music, your unapologetic authenticity, and the light that you shine in really hard, dark places. Um, you make the world better. Thank you, Brene Brown. You make the world better. You have made my world better, and that effect has allowed me to shine in this particular way. So I'm so grateful for you. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. <sighs> Was that just, what, what, how did it make you feel, Barrett, that conversation? It, it made my heart burst. I yes. Yes. He's a key dropping, heart bursting. He's the, he makes the world a place I want to live in. Yeah. That's how I felt like when I saw his TikTok. <laughs> yes, me too. Hate on me, hate on me, hate on me, hate on me. You might as well hate this. Okay, you just have to listen. Okay, so where do you find him? You can find his music on Spotify or wherever you listen to music. We'll also link to everywhere you can find Jake. His website is jakewesleyrogers.com. He's on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook. He's at Jake W. Rogers on Twitter. Again, we have episode pages for everything, all the episodes on Dare to Lead and on Unlocking Us. On episode day, my entire Instagram is going to be dedicated to Jake. All my stories are going to be Jake stories. Everything's going to be all things Jake. Just because we all need to shine on and no one does that like Jake. And we're going to end this episode with probably one of my favorite songs, Pluto. And I want to thank Jake for letting us play this. And I want to thank Warner Records for also letting us play this. And just... Find a place where the sun or a lamp hits your face and take it all in. I'm grateful for y'all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for Jake for just making my day and my month and making my heart grow two sizes too big. I'll see y'all next week. And man, if there's ever a podcast where I remind you to stay. Awkward, brave, and kind.
phải không em chuyện tình yêu đâu biết được ngày mai rồi hôm nay em bên ai nhìn em khóc trên vai thôi hãy quên đi về với em hiện tại anh còn nhớ về ngày ta còn đắm say anh vẫn nhớ về người bên anh khi ấy em đã quên rồi câu hứa yêu trọn đời em bỏ anh rồi em vui tình nhân mãi cuộc tình này đã khác rồi mình kết thúc em ơi chuyện tình này đã chết rồi còn thích chi em ơi một lần em gian dối rồi còn cố yêu không vui một lần em đã phán bội làm vết thương chưa vui thì anh vẫn sẽ nếm cười người khác làm em vui còn anh xin kết thúc và giữ chút đau thương thôi ở nơi xa luôn nhớ về một mối duyên tình phai đường em đi nay khác rồi còn mỗi Hãy